Last time I mentioned that there are a couple of varieties of diode lasers. We talked about the homojunction diode laser, which is formed from a single dye of gallium arsenide doped as FP-type and N-type on separate sides. But I also mentioned that you can make a double heterojunction quantum well diode laser, which we kind of talked about before. Let me just give a little more detail on that. You might recall from some previous discussion that what we have is a sandwich of P-type and N-type aluminum gallium arsenide with gallium arsenide in between. And the way you'll get those P-type and N-type is seen in the phase diagram for aluminum gallium arsenide, where this X, which tells you how much aluminum you have, is smaller you have p-type and if it's larger you have n-type and so by controlling the ratio of gallium to aluminum the carrier type can be controlled as well as the band gap and the p-type is a direct band gap semiconductor and the n-type is an indirect band gap and that actually can be taken advantage of i'm depicting here the photon leaving the edge of the die there's one other way i can say diode lasers come in two flavors edge emitting and surface emitting this is edge emitting, where the photon comes out the edge of the die, but we could uh, have the photon come out the top of the die as well. It requires some fancy footwork on the aluminum gallium arsenide layers. They need to be prepared in a Bragg grading sort of fashion uh, in order to control the optics. And then you get what's called a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. But anyway, describing the simpler idea of an edge emitting diode. Look at the band diagram for this. So you have the N-type on top here. It's all uh, it's 70% aluminum. And you have the P-type over here, and it's 40% uh, aluminum. And we put the, the negative voltage on the N-type and the positive voltage on the, the P-type. That way it's forward biased, right? So the, the positive voltage goes there. When it's forward biased, electrons are sort of suctioned toward the positive electrode, pushed away from the negative electrode. Holes are, tend to be pushed away from the positive electrode. What happens then is that in this gallium arsenide region, which has a smaller band gap than aluminum gallium arsenide, the electrons and holes get trapped because they get into this region and the conduction band edge comes down and the valence band edge comes up. And so they literally fill up like wells. And so it's referred to as the quantum well region. Electrons and holes are confined here and they're just kept until recombination happens. So they just they have to stay. The only way they can get out of here is to find each other and annihilate. And out comes a photon. So that's your quantum well laser. But then the photon can travel down the gallium arsenide well and leave. The direction of the photon is into the screen. That's the basic idea of the commercially successful type of uh, diode laser, <laughs> the double heterojunction laser. The population version is a, is a much more straightforward thing here because all you have to do is fill up the well. And when you fill up the well, you know, so you end up with a whole bunch of electrons on the conduction band and a whole bunch of vacancies in the valence band. So N2, which is the upper state population, is much larger. I should show, it's like have at least three greater than signs here. It's much, much, much larger than N1, the population of the, the lower level. You're very deep into population inversion, which, as we've talked about before, doesn't happen with thermal equilibrium. So in this particular structure, population inversion is achieved by current injection. The voltage is hooked up, connected, and then the holes are pushed to the, to the left and the electrons are pushed to the right. Current is driven through this tri-layer structure. That current affects the filling up of the quantum wells. And so injection current is the mechanism by which population inversion is achieved. What happens then when the light comes out? sort of drawn it, the photon going not the way I just told you it goes, but when the, when the photons come out of here, uh, the whole bunch of photons come out, they're going to have a little variety in energy or wavelengths. And so this is the spectral bandwidth of the diode laser. In fact, this is the spectral response of the laser that you're going to use in the lab experiment. It has a, a width, peak width, of about 5 nanometers and a frequency centered at 872 nanometers, I should say a wavelength, centered at 872 nanometers. And so you notice, you know, 5 nanometers is, is a little more than half a percent of that. It's very wide. But what you're looking at here is the spectral output of just the semiconducting die. 
that's so wide because I'll just remind you the product of density of states and Fermi Dirac distribution gives you the distribution of actual electrons and actual holes. So there's a variety of transition energies that can actually happen, not just from close to the gap edges to close to the gap edge, but uh, you know there, there's a range. And we need to tighten that up. So what's coming up next is how feedback optics can be used to narrow the line width. Feedback optics is used to select just a narrow band. And it can be whatever band you actually want as long as it's somewhere in this full width of half max.